the Vintage Gardener, welcome back to my channel. So today we are going over my plantagram for the Parterre Garden. Before I show it to you, I wanted to give you guys uh, three tips on what on designing a garden. Now listen, I know some of you guys are experienced gardeners and you don't have to listen to my spiel if you don't want to. And here's the timestamp to go to the next section. Uh, for those of you guys who are new, um, to gardening. I am not a professional designer. My real job is an attorney. Uh, gardening is something I do on the side. And so everything that I'm telling you is just what I have observed in successful gardens, um, what I consider to be a successful garden. So let's get into it. So thing number one, take your, uh, your house style into consideration. Uh, your garden is an extension of your house. They should match. Now my house, which I call Wildfell Manor, was built in 1840. It's a Victorian style farmhouse. It's kind of simplistic, but it's okay because I got some big plans for it. Uh, my, my goals are to renovate it. Well, more like restore it really. I'm not renovating it. I'm restoring it and elevating it to high Victorian style. And so I want the garden to match. So the first question I asked myself was, what type of garden would a Victorian have? Now, I looked on Pinterest, what's on there are really modern interpretations of a Victorian garden rather than something authentic. So I started looking around for like some authentic um, vintage gardens. And then I remembered that back in 2018, I had visited Bergwin Wright House in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a colonial house, so it's older than mine, but they did uh, various historic type gardens because it was a it was a uh, terrace property so they had the whole room concept going and one of them was a parterre and so I saw the design I liked it I remember researching it and I knew that at some point in time when I got a bigger a bigger house and a bigger yard I wanted to do one and I thought okay I should go ahead and do this so our parterre garden is basically a sophisticated uh, evolution of the knot garden uh, the knot garden if you guys have ever seen like the when people have taken shrubs and they kind of made like the celtic designs and they had like one shrub growing over another that's not garden now i'm not going to go into too much of an, a parterre garden is because that's going to be a subject of a cup podcast uh, but i refer to parterre gardens as being 3d designed because you're not just designing it from basically how it's going to look when in the garden which i think is like two-dimensional like you know width and length it's three-dimensional because you're taking into consideration how it's going to look from the ground but also it's meant to be enjoyed from above like from a second story window and so that is why i've been showing you guys all the pictures from my bedroom because that's kind of what it is um, in addition the beds themselves the way you plant the plants tend to form a pattern so it's just it's very interesting so that's why I decided to go with that one. That's an authentic garden and I'm gonna be doing some authentic planting. So thing number two, how much work do you wanna do? Okay, because gardening is work. It requires planting, maintenancing, you know, weeding, you know, planting, what have you. And, you know, as gardeners, we can kind of create a lot more work for ourselves than we need to. So the first way you can kind of create more work for yourself is in your actual design. So if you'll notice from my design, there is no grass. It's a grassless design. It is gravel walkways and there are flower beds and that is it. That was by design. That was the mistake I made at my last garden. I had grass paths. And even though my last yard was like a fifth of the size of mine, when it came to doing the lawn on Saturday, it took me just as much time because all those paths with the grass well in order for them to look great i had to edge okay and if i did not edge if i took a week off edging it just did not it wasn't a clean it wasn't a clean look um so i did it i kept up with it but you know i was like you know what? i should have put down gravel and so that's precisely what i did here because this garden is 2160 square feet I don't want to be edging like that. Uh, at my other house, I was I had a black and decker weed whacker, you know, with the tr um, 
you know, the string trim. I have something different now, but I was going through like four spools every single season because of the amount of edging that I had to do. Um, the other thing that can cause you more issues is what type of plants are you going to have? Like, are you going to have like, for example, a rose garden? Like I know someone who's got a acre rose garden. Now, that's a lot of maintenance. <laughs> That's a lot of maintenance. I mean, we're talking about deadheading, fertilizing, um, keeping on top of like pest issues. Don't get me wrong, I have roses and I love them. I can't imagine my garden without them, but would I want the entirety of my yard at that high maintenance? Absolutely not. Okay, so things like, are you gonna plant perennials? Uh, which are one and done deal where you know, they keep coming back you only have to plant them once you know they have uh, more minimal to moderate to minimal fertilization needs or are you going to plant annuals which you have to plant every single year if you plant annuals are you going to do what i do i'm putting in old-fashioned annuals um, i'm putting in things that are not highly hybridized you know things that are like heirloom seeds why? Because one thing about them is they seed freely. So once I plant them this one time, if I play my cards right, they should come back, they should self-seed and come back every year. So maybe I'll be pulling out a lot of volunteers, but I don't actually have to get down on my hands and knees and be plugging that stuff in the ground. Um, the other thing with a lot of old fashioned plants is that in terms of fertilization, you don't need to do a lot of it because a, a lot of them thrive in moderate to poor soil. That's, you know, fertilization, especially if you're going to be doing like, I mean, any type of fertilization, quite frankly, just the amounts of fertilizer, uh, is, it, it can be a problem. Um, and, you know, how much time do you have to devote? The other type of, you know, annual is something that's more hybridized, what I refer to as diva annuals. Um, I hate to say this, but the proven winner line. I mean, I stay away from the annuals. I like their, for example, their hydrangeas. I do. When it comes to the annuals, I just don't. Uh, they're highly, highly bred. Um, they are sterile. And so you have to buy them every year. And quite frankly, they're like $5 a pop. And I have a 2,100 square foot space. That's a lot of money I would be spending every year and that I just can't afford doing. Um, you know, the other thing is that having had them before, you have to fertilize the living daylights out of them to get them to look nice. And I like plants that you just put in the ground and they just do their thing. Like the zinnias I planted last year. I didn't fertilize those. <laughs> they just look great. <laughs> That's what I want because I don't want to spend time trucking around big tanks of fertilizer. Um, also, I mean, if you're new here, you might want to check out my podcast called uh, episodes called Nipic and Nipic 2 because I talk about the ecological effect of constant fertilization on the soil and even potentially environment like waterways and that sort of thing. So once again, you know, I'm looking, I know I'm going to have to do work, but certain types of things will increase the work. So the last thing is what is your personal style? Uh, one thing that I find in the U.S. is that when it comes to, we don't, people really don't garden. Everything is about like landscaping. Everything is about, you know, curb appeal. Curb appeal is fine, but your garden isn't about curb appeal. Your garden, you have to enjoy your garden. You have to like it. You have to walk out and say, oh my gosh, it has to make you happy. And if curb appeal, just like, you know, the... You know, the typical curb appeal does that fine, but that doesn't work for me. And quite frankly, you know, what I did in my last garden, yeah, that, that doesn't, that violated every curb appeal rule and everyone loved it. <laughs> um, I like color. I'm not a neutral girl. I don't like neutrals in anything, including the garden. And so um, I did struggle a little bit with the design that I did because I like all these colors. And at first I was planning to do a like a potpourri type planting, meaning that you've got like, you know, you've seen a thing of potpourri, they can get a little bit of everything, you kind of like, you know, blend in there. And I was struggling with working all that in. And, you know, I really didn't want to like <laughs> constrain my palette because I just liked so many different things. Well, when I was watching Danielle from um, North Lawn Flower Farm, I'll see if I can leak her um, YouTube channel here. She did a tour 
on uh, Longwood Garden and one of the sections of the garden, they did color blocking, which I was like, uh oh, that might work. <laughs> and with their color blocking, they kind of graded, it, it was like a color gradient. So it went from blue to pink, to peach, to yellow. And I was like, that could actually work. And so I tried seeing were there any samples of gardens on Pinterest and nobody, I didn't see it. But one thing I did come up with was a color wheel. Now on the outside edge of the parterre garden, which you're gonna see, I had 13 sections. Now a color wheel has 12, but I was like, you know what? I'll just make the last section white and we'll call it a day. Uh, so I started ordering seeds and I was like, okay, this is getting out of hand, which I mean, granted it kind of always gets out of hand, but it was really getting out of hand trying to find, you know, trying to do this whole 12, you know, 12 color thing. And I was on Outside Pride and realized they had wildflowers that were pink, orange, yellow, green, blue, pink, and white. And so they were packets. And all the, all the plants in there were the same color. Now, I know you guys are thinking wildflower in a Victorian. Yeah, it's not the traditional wildflower. These are not native plants that you find on the side of the road. Uh, basically, if they produce, like, for example, too much larkspur, too much, like, Tibetan poppy and too much, you know, purple phlox. Basically, they just mix those together. So in reality, I think they're like true, like cutting flowers, like more type deal. Um, so I think it'll be a great mix. So I got one of those. And so now I kind of refine my color wheel um, idea to something that's, that's very doable. So uh, I hope you guys found that uh, helpful. If you guys need resources, if you have any of questions, just leave it in the comment section. And without further ado, let's go look at my design. Okay guys, so here is my plantogram. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit scary here. So um, yeah, part of me is kind of embarrassed to show you this because I, I feel like it shows off my insanity here. So. Um, this is the design and the house is over here. So this is, um, after you come down my front stairs, you enter the garden like this. And so as you can see, I've got a collection of circles and squares here. So the circles represent one type of shrub. The squares represent a different type of shrub. And these big circles are a different type of shrub. And hold on, let me see if I can find one of them where I did this, but... I thought I labeled one of these little round circles as B, as A, and then one of the um, squares as B, because it, it's gonna go to the plant key, which is over here. And so um, I use the Mr. Pen landscaping design scent templates that are right here because they are drawn to scale. It's a quarter inch scale. And so the shrubs that I'm using for this part of the garden, uh, this is A, and if you go to the plant key up here, it is germander. I'm doing wall germander. And so a wall germander gets between 12 to 24 inches wide and high, but you can keep it as a short shrub. So I'm gonna keep it at 12 inches. So as you can see from the template, it's 12 inches is right there. And so that's what I use to draw my circles. Uh, the reason I do that is because for planning purposes, trying to figure out how much I need to grow, it's just easier to count it. Uh, most of the plants that I'm growing, I'm, I'm putting in here, almost all of them actually, are things that I'm going to be growing from seed. So I kind of counted up all the circles and at the end of the day, I need 513 germander and obviously I'm going to um, seed, you know, plant more than that because some may die and that sort of thing. Um, so I got their germander from outside pride because they sell it in higher quantities. I um, order 2000 seeds because it's usually between three to four seeds per to get a plant. And so that's how I did that. So, um, and of course if I have extras, I could put them other in the garden because it's not like this is the only garden I have. I've got the flower beds flank in the driveway, that's an additional 640 square feet. Plus I've got the um, sunset garden. So I, can, I have plenty of places to put extra plants. And on top of that, I'm part of a gardening group called Seeds with Friends. And I'm sure that if I offer free plants, somebody is going to take them to give them a good, a good home. 
Okay, so the uh the boxes, these are sky uh pencil holly. And so I need that's B and I need uh 26 of those. I think I have like 17 or 19 maybe. So I only have to get I have to get a few more to finish off the design. Now, these shrubs that are in the center, I'm probably going to go with Arbavita or something like that because I want to do topiaries. And so um, I need 10 of those for my diagram. Um, this is the fountain. I did it blue because blue for dark blue for a water feature. Okay. And this is how you can see I have done the whole, uh, you know, what's it called? Uh, the color wheel. Okay. So I put the blue over here because I did find this one type of poppy. It's called Lingstrom, it's Menacompus Menacom, Menacom, something, I, I can't remember, but it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a hybrid of a Tibetan poppy and a Himalayan poppy. And it's not really part of the pop of our family, but it looks similar. And so they need partial shade and this side of the yard, because there's a big tree, gets more shade. So that's why I started with this over here. Um, the blue section. I'm going with the blue color shades wildflowers from outside pride and so it's going to be blue purplish and I'm going to try to like blend the color into here into the pink and pink and then red orange yellow and <laughs> green so I know I'm sure you guys have noticed that I've got scribbles around the outside uh, those are the seeds that I know that I already have um, and I'm don't get me wrong it's see that right there that's a box I didn't even go through the box I was just talking about the seeds <laughs> that I ordered so it's kind of scary and so um as you can see like I labeled K L and that sort of thing so here's my plant key over here um so uh D okay so here's D D's in here uh this is the fountain on each side of the fountain I said I was going to do a memorial garden and so I kind of have a color scheme. I haven't finished plotting this section out or this section right here, which is why it's all white. But um, for one section, it's gonna be a green halo peony. And then um, E is going to be riches and fame peony. F is a uh, Henry Box, Bo Box Stos peony. And then G is, let's see, do tell peony. And I do have another set called Celebrity. I'm not sure where I'm going to put that yet. And so then, of course, with the block colors, you know, I just label that as pink shade, red shade, orange shade, yellow shade, green shade, blue shade, white shade. And so the uh, the blue and white, I'm just going to kind of mix into here <coughs> to kind of give me my look. So that's how I did that. So that kind of looks insane, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of does okay so let's go around some of the about go through some of the plants I've got on the outside now some of them I have right here and I think you'll be able to tell which sections they go with but let me sort them out right quick okay so now I've got that all that sorted okay so I have to do a circle around here Okay, so in the blue section, and some of these I don't have yet. Um, I am ordering a lot of seeds from GeoSeed, and so here you can see my list, and then it goes on the back side. <laughs> and yes, I'm spending a lot of money, so here we go. Um, so I'm doing yarrow, which is a lilac color, foxglove, sugar plum, I was this purple, scabiosa, Isaac House blend. That's kind of like a bluish, purplish, and white. Um, that's I had that this year and then I have amazing gray poppy which looks like this and then I have a uh, scabiosa perfect clear blue nigella moody blue <coughs> um, Siberian iris and Siberian iris I'm going to get from it's called van I don't know K van whatever however you pronounce that and so I tagged I tagged stuff I can find it very quickly and that's another thing um just just go through magazines you know and just tag stuff so uh I'm doing it with black joker which is right here because it's got blue in it and then I'm going to go with so van go which is right here and then the other one is ice cream which is right there so those colors will look really nice in there 
And then coming around this way, I've got corn flour, uh, the fantasy mix. With the um with GU seeds, they have so many, so much. I so much. As a matter of fact, here's the book right here. Um, there's no pictures in it, but there's a lot of things that actually are perennials. Like for example, corn corn flour. There are some that are perennial. Um, so I did get some corn flour that are perennial that are blue. I'm saying fantastic mix. And I've got delphinium, Bella Mosin, delphinium, Clive Jim Beauty. Um, I did uh, the Himalayan and Tibetan poppy, which I can't remember what the name is, of it is. I did flax, blue, and breezy. And I have that right here. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do winter sowing with this one as well as starting them. Some of them like normal. And then I'm gonna do California bluebells, which are right here. <laughs> and then let's go into the uh, pink section, which is gonna come around up here. Um, Angel's Choir Poppy, which I don't have. Um, I have Aster no Nova Belgi. That's a purple aster, and it is a perennial. Oh, and last but not least, here's the blue wildflower and I didn't put it on there but I got butterfly pea um, tie double blue um, I, my sister got me that for Christmas so thank you little sister okay and so here we go uh, let's see oriental poppy Victoria Louise this is a pink one that's a perennial poppy then I have hollyhocks fruity mix which is going to be like a peach a peachy pink pastel. Um, then down here I have Nigella uh, Mulberry, Mulberry Rose, which is, um, Nigella is, um, my goodness, love in a mist. Okay, then I have a Sheffield Pink Mom. That's the one you saw in the video for Hortalus Farm. And then I have Pink Dandelion, which is this one right here. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. And then, let's see. Okay, and so there's a Flemish um, antique poppy, which is kind of reddish pinkish, so I'm probably gonna kind of put some on each side of this border. And so that's what that one looks like. Um, I'm doing a red yarrow, aster September ruby, American Legion poppy, a scabiosa, scabiosa Beaujolais bonnet. And then I'm gonna do, let's see, Carnation King of Blacks, and then Cherry Bronze Snapdragon. And of course, here's the red color shade wildflower and the pink ones. And then moving around to the orange side, I've got uh, Lupine Sunrise, Prince of Orange Poppy. That's a, uh, a perennial Scabiosa Salmon Queen, a Salmon, salmon pop, a Peony Poppy, which is... Oh, you know what? I realized it's in this plastic bag right here because I forgot I'm doing. Okay. I forgot to. It was in a plastic bag because I'm doing cold stratification. So, this is the frosted salmon poppy. Also, in the red section, I forgot is going to be a floor, um, poppy floors pepper box that's going in there. Uh, so, let's continue on the orange section. Um, Let's see, light salmon snapdragon and bronze snapdragon. And then the yellow section, I've got hollyhock banana. And then, let's see, here's the orange wildflowers. Here's the yellow wildflowers. Um, I'm also going to be doing craspedia. Um, I have coneflower mellow yellows. That's a perennial, obviously. And let me come around here. Okay, so in the yellow section, we have um, foxglove, cafe creme, foxglove, chocolate, which is kind of like a brownish bronzy, like a deep, yeah. So I think I'm gonna put that in the yellow section, we'll see. Then I have a straw flower, which is golden, straw flower, silver rose, which should actually be in the pink section. Don't ask me why I put it over there. And um, lupine, there's one, there's festival mix that's a yellow. Then obviously there's the yellow mellow coat flower, Craspedia, and then the lemon sherbet snapdragon. Um, and then I have the green section. And the green section, um, let's see, 
There's Rudbeckia Green Wizard, so that's a perennial. There's Bells of Ireland. Um, I'm gonna get some more green halo peonies. I think I maybe, I don't know if I can order any more because usually those have already sold out. Then I did um, Green Star Gladiolus, and, guide, and it's called Guiden Gladiolus. And then Honeydew, Con Honeydew Coneflower, uh, Green Twister Coneflower, which I have a couple, but I think I'm gonna put them in the Memorial Garden. So I'm gonna get a couple more from uh, Stonebridge uh, Garden Peddler. And then let's see, um, Tequila and Lime Daily. So that's in this book over here. So let me show you. Okay, so that's the Tequila and Lime Daily. And it reblooms. But I'm gonna go to the lady down the street, the Oak Tree Acres Daylily Farm. I'm gonna email her and see if she has a green daylily because she's a local breeder. She has like some specialty stuff that you don't won't see in the magazine. She may have something, and I'd like to support a local business if I can. Um, and let's see. Here we go. So uh, this is the Honeydew Coneflower, and that's the Green Twister. So as you see those. I mean, I know the Green Twister's got pink in it, but you know, we gotta do what we gotta do, right? Okay, so this is Gaiden, which is a green and white gladiolus. And then down here is the green star gladiolus. And listen, there's other gladiolus that I'm gonna get. It's just that the way I was approaching this was try to find perennials in the harder to find colors first. Because, you know, finding things that are orange and pink and even yellow, I mean, as you can see from this thing, it's much easier to do that. So, um, that's what I've got right now. Okay guys, so now that you've seen my design, I'm going to be doing some winter sewing, a lot of winter sewing, <laughs> and I will be color coding my terrarium. So that is gonna start actually a little bit next week. So do not miss that episode, okay? So I'll see you guys later. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and um, happy planting.